everybody. So glad to be back in the studio. I think that we are so hyped up from what happened this weekend. I wanted to bring my friend Doran from Wangard Ministries uh, here today in the studio to recap the return, an event that was held in D.C. on the mall. And uh, man, there was a lot happening on the mall, but we went with some of our friends, uh, ministry partners, and uh, connected. Uh, we went a little early. We were doing some media stuff with the AGA Network, America's Greatest Awakening Network. And uh, so we'd live stream from the mall. And uh, and then we met up with some friends, uh, Doran and his wife, Melissa, and uh, Lamar and Janet Troyer. And uh, we just had a blast. But what I want to talk today about is, number one, what the return was, number two, why we went, and then number three, what can we take away from that event? And then we'll also leave links or whatever so you can see it. If you haven't seen the return, you can go to the return.org or you can go to the AGA network and watch it. Um, but we're excited. So Doran, welcome to the studio. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thank it's you. good to it's have good you. Good to be here. Good to be good to have you and good to be here together. So the return, um, Jonathan Kahn and a group of his friends uh, dreamed up an event in which people of Christ would come. Yeah, six years ago. Six years ago, yeah. <laughs> uh, would come together and pray for repentance and restoration of our country. And uh, and so tell me about your vision, uh, why you went. Um, but actually, let's back up a little bit. Tell me a little bit about Wangard Ministries. Tell them about Wangard Ministries. And then, uh, and then we'll go into why we went and all those different things. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so... Wingard Ministries is all about hope. Uh, God told me a while ago, he wants me to give people hope. And so looking at any situation, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be uh, a need for hope. And so looking at the return, I, the moment I saw it, I, I just felt like I'm supposed to be there. And for, I guess, the reason of... Uh, holding the city in my heart and praying and, and being a part of it because uh, we, we want to see these big changes and big, uh, you know, breakthrough and revival and, and exciting things happen, but it really is one at a time it happens in our hearts. And so when I'm uh, meeting with a person one-on-one -on -one or if I'm preaching in front of a group, I really am wanting to have the focus of touching each person's heart. And, and bringing hope to, you know, delivering hope to every heart, uh, which is one of our slogans. And so that was really a big catalyst of, of being in D.C. is that the whole, the whole gathering was all about hope for the future. Uh, instead of sort of cowering in the face of things that, uh, you know, could be discouraging, it's like, okay, we're, we'll deal with that, but let's look to the future. I love that. We go to D.C. and there's a, you know, around the country there's fear. Um, we go to D.C. and there's none of that on the mall. Um, there's none of that even in the police officers. Exactly. There's none of that. I, Other than a couple restaurants that we we had to go in, um, we, we got to go in, I, I didn't see any fear that I saw in other places that I've been around the country in the last seven exactly. months. And that was super exciting because it's the seat of power. It's the head. And, you know, um, David didn't aim for anything but the head. And so we know that there's power there in, in all of that. So um, so we felt the same call. AGA was asked to go and report live from uh, the return and, and to go and be a part of that. So we were excited that we got to connect there and, uh, and see. So tell me your perspective on what happened as you arrived, the climate that you found, um, and those different things. Sure. Uh, so one of the instructions of just that we had heard kind of uh, through the grapevine is that don't travel to D.C. unless it's for essential business, you know. And so they, they really had not experienced a lot of tourism, uh, at least from uh, a guy that we talked to that lives there, and, and he was – he was astounded. He said, I haven't seen this many people on the mall all year. Like this is, this is massive. And he wanted to know, you know, why, why we're there, what's going on. And, and we found this open environment, uh, an environment actually of, of joy and excitement of, of the local people saying, wow, we, we love having you guys here. This is, 
this is life. Like we literally brought life to the city just by going, just by being there. Uh, you know, go to the restaurants, tip big, um, smile at everybody and, and, and bring life. Uh, it, it was amazing how well we were received. It was exciting. We met, uh, Jen and I were actually out walking Thursday. Um, a lot of people came Friday. We went Thursday a day early and we were out walking. We met a couple from California and, uh, they were saying the same thing. Like we heard like, oh no, don't go to DC. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. And, uh, and so much friendliness from not just locals, but we met people from states all around the country, from other countries. And it was like the, we were back to some semblance of normal where we could just be the church. We could just be ourselves and, and watch God move in our midst. Well, I, I feel like I still am normal in my yeah, heart. Exactly. So we brought normal. We brought normal. We brought there it you there. Go. Yeah, exactly. And, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and we're able to see that when you act normal in an unnormal state, people act normal. Uh, it's not the opposite. You don't get contaminated with non-normal. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. And That's people good. don't, uh, like fear is actually unnatural. People don't want to be in fear all the time. And so uh, when you walk into a situation without fear, uh, it's really um, one, one of the indicators to me, and this is something that, that I've chosen to do because it is a conviction that I have. I, I don't wear a mask because it's, to me, it's a sign of fear uh, of both when it comes to the virus itself, but then also how others respond to me. And I'm not out crusading and trying to make a big point. It's just something that I do. And I want to smile at people. I want to show them love and I want to be, I want to give, give life to them. And I'm not a contamination. So I don't, I don't bring anything with me and I'm not afraid of something that someone else has. And it was amazing to see just the, the joy on people's faces. Uh, I know there's been a lot of controversy over that, uh, but it really it is uh, just looking at, kind of ig- ignoring the controversy and just saying, hey, how's it going? And, and smiling at people and bringing life. There, there was a lot of people. We were, we were definitely, uh, I felt like, in, uh, in the majority most of the people that were there were just bringing life with them. And, and we met up with some friends from Washington state, from, uh, other, other, you know, all around the country. And they were there for the very same reason, just to bring the life of God there. Yeah. And to humble ourselves, you know, mm-hmm. second Chronicles seven fourteen was the returns verse. And, uh, so we humble ourselves and we ask the Lord to move. And then we are his movement on the earth. And so that, that was just a great time. So tell me about an encounter that you had, um, with someone, not at the event, not of the event, but just an average person there that, that you would say was a significant time there. Um, so I, I actually was, uh, I was watching people as much as interacting, uh, and, and seeing how they interacted with each other. And I love the fact that, that, that there, was, there were people from all walks of life. And, and uh, we actually stood right next to some, some people from, uh, I think they were Indonesia or Philippines. And they were so excited to be there. And, and there were several other countries that uh, were represented of people that have come from um, a, a more controlled communist type of environment. And for them to be in in the center uh of the the representation of freedom of our country it was really exciting uh and so that all the way to there was amish people from our area that were there and to see them worshiping freely and excited to to um be a part of it but then also on their knees and in repentance not just for themselves but for the actions of our country uh over so many years and and no, anything from 62 million babies that have been aborted uh, to the atrocities um, against uh, other, you know, people groups that are part of our, our country itself. Uh, anything that was that has been part of our history, but but looking at it and saying, you know what, we are part of this country and we do uh, repent. And so I I felt a lot of humility, even in conversations with people. So. Uh, I know I didn't answer your question on a specific person, right. um, but just the, 
to see that on on so many people's faces was so exciting. And when Jonathan asked for us to get on our knees and to repent, to pray, um, to see thousands and thousands of people on the muddy grass just go because it was the right thing to do. Um, it wasn't because they were told to do it. It was because there was an actual spiritual movement that was happening, which was so powerful. Um, I had an interaction with a security guard in which um, someone who didn't do church. In fact, that was her quote. I don't do church, which is good. I said, I don't do church either. Um, but, but I do Jesus. And that's, that's a cool thing. And, and when she said, I've never seen so many people here who are getting along that are from so many different walks of life, different religions, different denominations, all that stuff, but they're here for this event. Um, it really struck me that whether the people there that were working, which were a lot of volunteers for everything that was happening, whether they knew God or whether they knew uh, anything about him, they saw him mm -hmm. and his character in the people that were there, which is so powerful. And that's what we should be doing every day is reflecting him. But to see it, uh, to hear it from a security guard saying, I needed to, she said, I needed to take notice of this because it's so different than what I expected God to be like. And that's good. I said, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And so, you know, that is what the church should be showing every day. Um, but it was great to see it with tens of thousands of people. And then on the other end of the mall, you have Franklin Graham with 50, 60, 100,000, whatever it is. And they walked up and joined us, which was so awesome. Um, so, yeah, just that the people, of, the people of the city got to experience the love of Christ through the body. And, uh, and that's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that just uh, there was one group that was protesting, uh, which we were you know, kind of uh, anticipating something that, yeah. you know, might be part of it. But what we saw was no one reacted negatively to them. And, I mean, they were, uh, it was it was a BLM group of, of you know, misled college kids. <laughs> they, yeah. they were just, uh, they, they think they're doing something good, but they just don't, they just don't know. Right. And uh, we just saw so much love. The people that, um I mean, they're screaming curse words at him and, and you know, uh, cursing it at Trump and, and at God and, you know, anything else. And, and people just surrounded them and just prayed for them, not in a, not in a bad way, like we're, we're trying to hold you in, but we are, we're just loving you. And it was, um, it really just diffused the, the issue, which is, you know, a great example of, of what we can do every day of our lives. You, you meet a person that's frustrated and to be able to see through their frustration and, and look at it and go, you know, I don't know what their situation is. And uh, I may not have an answer for their situation, but I can love through, through the, the curse words <laughs> mm -hmm. or, you know, right. the anger and look at them and say, you know what? God loves them. And, and there is a, there's a special place that, that he has for them and all they just need to see. Uh, and, and when they do, I'll be here. So that I, I saw that uh, actively happening uh, just with, with a group of, of kids who were, you know, trying to kind of come against it. Yeah. And, you know, I, speaking about changing the city, I talked to uh, one of the food truck drivers or cooks, whatever he was, I'm sure he drove his own truck, but um, there. And, and I said, so what is this week like? And he said, I, I feel like I've got my business back, wow. you know, and, and wow. so, so not only did Sounds we like bring hope, right. Not only did <laughs> we bring hope, not only did we love people, but we actually brought commerce that they haven't seen in forever. And he didn't have to drive 30 minutes outside the city and sit in a, a Lowe's parking lot to sell a hundred dollars worth of stuff. He was able to be uh, an asset and he provided a service which was totally awesome and we got to talk to him and just engage and i think that those kind of things uh leaving aside all the stuff that we were there for just the personal interaction people are craving that Absolutely. in this hour people are just desiring to be with people and uh and what a better way to do it than to pray and and to be in that place so to the event itself um man jam-packed uh, I don't even know how many speakers, probably over 50, uh, but the list was super long. And uh, and from Friday when it started till 
Saturday when it was over, it was just there wasn't a stop at all. It was just yeah, it was power like the, packed. It was like a fireworks show where they they actually had two podiums and they'd load one mortar in the can and <laughs> and fire it off and, and as soon as that person's done the lights would go on the next podium and they there was just a constant it, it was really well done. Yeah, they I mean you could tell that they planned this thing out for a long time and and it was good. So let's talk for a few minutes about uh, your takeaway from the program itself. Uh, whether it be Friday, Saturday, whatever, um, the, the what had been laid out, how it was communicated, and the benefits of it. Sure. Uh, so the the thing that probably impacted me the most initially was that uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn made a special point of saying, "This is not something that that I'm doing or we're doing by ourselves." He, he said, "You are the ministers. You." All of you. So, so if we look at 50,000 people, and he says, you are the ministers. In other words, we are the ones that, that felt the burden on our heart to show up in the city and to pray for the city, to pray for the country, to pray for the, the government and, and, and all of that. And it really was an act of humility from the very start. And I was really impressed by that. And, and it really set the tone uh, for, the whole, for the whole time, which to me, it was key for uh, really the reason that I was there as well. I wasn't there just to do something myself. I wanted to join in uh, with others in an act of humility and repentance as well. And it brought the, the unity that we all preach about. It actually brought it into fruition in 2020 amidst a pandemic, amidst craziness going on in the world. We had unity with a unity of heart that um, really shook the foundation of the country, I believe, in the end. Um, so, so Friday night, looking at the next generation, um, was, a, was a very interesting time for me. I'll tell you, I was a little conflicted um, with it because looking at the names on all the lists of, of everything that was going to happen, I noticed that it was a lot of, of the past generations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then to see Friday night, to see that there was a, there was some emphasis toward the next generation. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to see that in a tangible way. Um, and it was good to see that on the platform. And I think that the, the thing that I saw in the crowd was the same thing. It was a lot of the, the older generation not a ton of the younger generation. And it leads to this question that how much do you believe the education and indoctrination of our country has led to a separation of generations instead of a uniting of generations? Well, I, I believe it has been intentional for, for decades. Uh, the, the education system has been hijacked from from long ago uh where you know even teaching kids to to mistrust or distrust uh the the founding fathers and their intentions and then current government leaders instead of you know pulling together it's more about let's pull away and and criticize uh and i remember i mean teachings like that in high school uh which you know has been a few years ago yeah and I, I did recognize the fact that we were um, probably some of the younger ones that were there. And so there was definitely an absence of the, uh, you know, teens, 20s, 30s uh, age. And yet I, I did think about the fact that uh, we have a little bit more freedom to do that, to travel to the, right. the, the city and to mm -hmm. be there. So my hope is that even if they weren't able to be in person, be there in person that they could actually join in. Uh, and we did hear some of that, you know, coming back of people that were literally watching the entire time and, and, yeah. and were joining Well, through in. technology, we can do that. And I think that one of the great things about the event was it was not a an ending point. It was a exactly. starting point. And so we brought it back to our kids. So did you. Yep. Um, and, and our kids are consuming that event. Um, and our kids are consuming what was said, the prophetic words that were spoken, the, you know, maybe they weren't there in person. Hopefully they were watching on technology. And this is something that I believe is just the beginning of a movement. 
Um, but that was just one observation that I had. And so the, the event itself was an event of being humble, being unified and saying, uh, God, we are, we are repenting for the decisions that have been made. And one of the decisions that I think that we as the church, if we, if I can speak that way, uh, the church in general, um, has missed the mark on is being a voice and having the using the authority that we've been given to actually shape policy, to shape those things. So we're in D.C., the head of this, and yet everything that is wrong is coming from that area in policy. Mm-hmm. And so I felt a, a super uh, pulling on my heart for that that specific thing is that we need to repent as the church for not being involved in those things when it was a critical mm-hmm. point, and now we are, which is great, but now we got to do something with it. Yeah, the 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 quote of the only thing necessary for you know evil to advance is for good people to do nothing. Right, and so we have definitely abdicated our role and and allowed that to happen. Uh, and I say we in that you know the the church uh, or even just good moral people who have done nothing. Uh, and it's actually, it brings up a, a point of um, something that happened on uh, Facebook there. My, my wife actually posted just uh, so good to be here at the return and uh, praise the name of Jesus uh, openly. And there's someone that I actually attended high school with that posed a question and it was very respectfully done. Um, he, he's a good man uh, he asked the question very nicely, but he said uh, something like, just curious uh, what your thoughts are on the separation of church and state. Uh, I find it ironic, your comments, given their location. So in other words, it, it sounded like uh, since you are in the nation's capital, uh, it, are you sure that you're correct in, in you know? And so <laughs> I, I, I had this like all stop moment of, wow, I, I don't, just, just to think that way is a misunderstanding of the int- the initial intention of the founding fathers, because their their goal was not to to keep God and church out of government, but to keep government from interfering with church and God. So uh, the separation of church and state is a, is a statement that comes from a personal letter, has nothing to do with the actual writings of even the first amendment that congress shall make no law shall make no law that that uh um how's it worded uh that congress shall make no law religion. respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thereof yeah and so looking at that we were we were uh having free expression and the fact that we are in the nation's capital is exactly in keeping with the intentions of the, the founding fathers and of the Constitution itself. And so not only should we be on the mall, we should be in the seats in Congress. We should be in the, in the Oval Office. We should be in the Supreme Court. We should be in, in all of the you know, higher offices there. We should be the police officers on the street. We should be the school teachers in the schools. We should be in every area of influence in our country. That is our role. And it, it is something that is being um, taken back. It really is. Uh, but it is a process in the fact that so many laws have been written that, that go against the laws of God, that go against um, morality in general, uh, and, and are, have, have allowed evil to progress. And so... Uh, it was really good to be there and to be the ones uh, of influence and to see, you know what, this is the beginning of, of a major change in our country. It is, yeah. And and to go back to the comment, um, you were able to to give that opinion that you just stated um, to him, and that's, that's a good thing. I wanted to read the actual – there's a building in D.C. Um, that I took a picture of, and on the, on the very front of the building, it says – the actual First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Wow. 
There you go. And it's That's right like on the building. music to my ears right there. I know. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the assault that's on not only the church, the assault that's on, uh, that's on, you know, the freedom that we have, you know, see, the, the thing that always interests me about the First Amendment and, and the separation of church and state is that it's always brought up as to be that we get our freedom from our government, and that's completely wrong. We get our freedom from God, which is totally sweet. And that means that, yeah, governments come and go, but he doesn't. And uh, Hebrews 13, 8 is awesome and that he doesn't change. And so, um, so that fundamental difference is why sometimes that, uh, that statement of separation of church and state is misconstrued. Well, and it's really a flip-flop of the way it was initially designed in that the, the government rests on the shoulders of Jesus. So right. the government is on his shoulders. In other words, he everything is supported. If you take church out of state, there is no state. Right, exactly. You can't have church um, being being controlled by the state right. or, or it no longer is doing its job. And so that whole part of it where there is a flip-flop and, and – it, it comes back to the Johnson Amendment. It comes back to the you know churches uh, coming under the the five hundred one c three fear of we don't want to lose our tax free status, um, and so you know we submit and we'll we'll close our mouths and not say the truth. No, that 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 is actually the the biggest probably exciting thing to me to see that that churches and pastors are finding their voice and they're saying you know what, we will not be muzzled because we do know the truth. We, we know him mm-hmm. and, and we know the word. Yeah. And to know that we as individuals do not get our freedom from a government. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We get our freedom from the Lord and that's where, that's where it happens. So, um, so the event, uh, many powerful speakers, name one that stood out to you other than Jonathan Khan, cause that was <laughs> the most powerful thing I've heard in a long time. And I think that he said, specifically um, that we are not here for a politically correct message. We're here for the truth. And so if you haven't seen it, go back and watch his 12 o'clock address, which was fire. But, um, but I want to know of another person who spoke that you connected with and uh, that you um, just, what, what is that story? What's that heart connection? It, it, it would have been Friday night, Nikki Cruz. Uh, yeah, make sure you watch, uh, all everything from Friday night all the way through Saturday, uh, because it it was what I loved about it is unfiltered. (laughs) So he, he didn't uh, try to be politically correct. Pat Boone was not politically correct at all. (laughs) And, uh, and it was, it was fun to see that, that here's a man that is in his mid eighties. Uh, and he, I mean, he grew up as a, a kid in a terrible situation uh, from Puerto Rico and where his, his mother and father were both um, into satanic worship and, and would beat him. He tried to kill himself at the age of nine and found himself on the streets as a teenager and just trying to die in some way or another. And so he, he was in so many gang fights and, and he just wouldn't die. And he ended up leading these gangs uh, and, and, found himself in, in this, uh, facing this preacher, David Wilkerson, uh, and, and found a man with no fear. And so it was a representation to me of exactly where we stand because, uh, you know, you mentioned pandemic, uh, there is no pandemic mm-hmm. other than the pandemic of fear. Yeah. So, yes. uh, you know, if we, if we say, Oh, the pandemic, I look at it and I say, who all is in fear around here? Because fear is contagious, mm-hmm. absolutely. Right. Fear can be forced upon you, uh, and it's it's it. W- what I um, see in Nikki Cruz's story is that he stood there trying to to attack with fear, and I mean he's threatening to kill uh, David Walker, and I'll cut you up. I, <laughs> talking in his in his Puerto Rican accent, you know, and and, and he's and it was great because uh, he he was just recounting it, and you could tell he he. Had, it's like he was just there. And David Wilkerson said, if you cut me up, every piece on the street, every piece of my body is going to cry out, Jesus loves you. And he, he, Nikki could not fight the love. Mm-hmm. And so that, to me, was an example of 
exa- uh, of what we bring. We bring love, and we do not bring fear because perfect love casts out fear. And that's really, you know, the fact that God is love, mm-hmm. and, and in him is no fear. Right. So love is the dominant power, and, and this, we don't win this by more fighting. We don't win this by by uh, producing or trying to bring more fear, bring fear back on on the purveyors of fear. No, we love. We love right through the middle of it, and it diffuses it. And there, Nikki found himself on his knees, uh, repenting and finding the Lord Jesus, and and his life was changed. And here he is, how many decades later? Sixty decades, <laughs> six, sixty, 60 years, years later. Yeah. And, and he's, he's still preaching about the goodness of God and what God did and how he changed his life. And he gave a message, uh, an invitation, and it was so genuine. And I just, I believe that there was thousands of lives changed and will continue to be as people watch this. Yeah. And that's the great thing about media today that, that they can watch it. I, you know, in scripture, Jesus gives the world one way that they can evaluate a believer. And that is that they can pull back the curtain on every believer's life and say, do they love? And if they love, then they're my disciples. How they love one another, how they mm-hmm. love each other. And I think that you see that in David Wilkerson's, you know, in in Nikki's testimony of David Wilkerson, that he was going to love him no matter what. And him being in the world and living in fear and frustration and trying to find a way out of here um, was able to, connect to that love when he pulled back the curtain on david wilkerson's life he saw love and that's the goal that we all should have is that when the world pulls back the curtain on us that's what they see Mm -hmm. and i just love that the lord gave uh the world that and gave us that as our you know litmus test for whether we are disciples true disciples of jesus Mm -hmm. so uh one of the speakers that really the the prophetic voice was heard by many um kent christmas had an amazing uh word and uh i think with in in the recent words that i've heard from him now we're living in them which makes it even better whenever they they're actually not just spoken but they're actually lived out and uh and so this one that that he had i i believe really will transform uh we're going to watch the world transform, but we're going to watch the church transform even better Mm -hmm. uh, as we engage in, in the next few years of, of life. So uh, great things that, that happened. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion conversation. I, we were inside the fence. We were in our cage for media, uh, which was interesting, but I heard a lot of conversations of people, as you said, talking about what happened the night before on Saturday. There was a lot of people talking, reminiscing about the night before. How do we as individuals, whether you've watched it online, whether you were there, how do we as individuals keep those conversations going that this event isn't just an event that passes away in our in our memory as, oh yeah, we were there, but it really does change our lives. What What does that look like for the person who experiences this? I think it's really what what uh, I just did. Like I, I take Nikki's story and I apply it to today, right. and and that's what I've tried to do for me personally. And I've had conversations, actually quite a few conversations, with people just saying, "Oh, how was it? What was going on?" and and just to to bring it from DC and say, "This is what I experienced." Now, now look at what you're experiencing here. And uh, how can you apply this same principle? Um, the people want to hear stories, of course they do. Uh, so it's good to to be able to, you know, remember and tell the stories uh, of of things like that, either speakers or people that we talk to. Uh, but to simply tell them as this was the event and this is what happened and and let it die there does not um, it, it it doesn't translate into another changed life. So I think really is, is trying to look for ways to apply those very things today. So if, you're, if you've watched it, if you were watching it live, I encourage you to go back, watch it again, uh, write down those things that transformed your thought processes, transformed your heart, um, things that connected with you so that you can do what Dorn just described, and that is to 
take those stories that have touched you and and retell them with the current status of life w- with your current situation and make them applicable to your life and the person that you're talking to so that these events don't die off. And as a pastor, and I know you understand this because you travel and speak a lot, but um, my biggest desire is not that I have a million people to hear my voice. My biggest desire is that it what the Lord has given me to share with you changes something in you that you now become the propagator of that truth. And um, that's what we say at the summit all the time is I want you to take whatever God has given to you, whatever that nugget of truth is, let it change you so that now it becomes a part of your testimony so you can share with other people. And that's what we're describing. So if you haven't engaged with it, you can go to livefromthereturn.com. You can sign up there and you'll get access to uh, recordings and different things um, that happen there. So uh, just that part of it, we can't let this stop. So I want to, I want to hear the, we talked about the event. We talked about people. I want to hear the spiritual things that you encountered there um, that, people may not get through the screen um, that you personally encountered with the Lord there. I I would love to. Uh, So there was two very specific things that happened. And, and, you know, when you're at an event, there's, there's thousands of people around. There's a lot of energy. Uh, The speakers are loud. The, you know, there's, there's just a lot happening, a lot going on and, and it's exciting to be there. So there is definitely an emotional component that is hard to reproduce um, digitally on, and, and watching it. So I guess if you're watching it, just turn it up and, and um, act like there's a lot of people around. Um, but the the thing that uh, that I sensed and, and really it it happened uh, unexpected. I wasn't just trying to have an experience uh, specifically at that moment, but uh, during the time of, it was, it was about three quarters of the way through, uh, and it was it was making declarations over our country. Uh, it was very specific in the fact that this was done by a um, a Jewish rabbi, and the fact that the Jews are the people of God, and and that God uh, wrote the the law of of how to approach Him, not to keep us under a law, but to give us a blueprint of how to connect with him. And so the fact that that was happening, we were, we were um, actually speaking out to the four winds uh, and Jonathan Kahn is there blowing the, the seven trumpets, the, the shofar seven times and each, each one has a significance and, and he's very specific with how he, he speaks it out and says, and, and, Something happened during that time of, of prophecy and declaration uh, that he, he would say, um, no, no, you believe it. You believe it and you pray for it. Wow. Like when, when I blow the, the trumpet, because it really came back to the fact that all 50,000 of us were the ministers. Mm-hmm. And he says, you believe it. You pray for it. I will blow the trumpet and you shout and agree. Uh, and when that happened during that, that time of the seven trumpets, there was a, uh, I, I saw a vision and I had this, it, it's, it, I actually saw the visible light bend and it's, it was like a, a blast, but not in a, like an atomic bomb sort of way uh, of, you know, a negative. It was just this ooh, impact. And then it's like, I, I, I raised up and I could see all the way to the Atlantic and I could see up you know, north and south, and this this impact of of a wave just traveled across all the way into the Atlantic, north and south, and then as I was watching, it sort of rolled back across the country. And as it was doing, I saw this just beautiful sky appearing behind it, and and I realized this is it's a deception that it's actually rolling off of our country, and it got all the way to the the Pacific Ocean. I uh, got to California and Arizona and Washington State, and 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 as it rolled out into the Pacific Ocean, there was this beautiful sunset. And at first, I thought, "Sunset is that the sunset of our country?" <laughs> and and I I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was a 
it was a, a, a deep knowing and very clear words. And he said, I will do it today. This is Shabbat Shuva. Our country was changed in a day. So with the sunset that I saw was the sunset of Sabbath. It, it was established that Sabbath begins at sunset and ends at sunset. And so uh, it was a very clear word that he said, today, today is the day it changes in our country. And so I, I'm standing on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's I, the most amazing thing about that is the significance of a Jewish rabbi leading um, and, uh, and then seeing that picture, I think we all felt it that we're there. Um, what you saw, we felt, and that's the power of being in a, being in a group of people. And I believe that the assault on the church, um, as a whole in this country has been to stop us from gathering together because when we gather together, there's significant impact that happens even if it's just five people in your living room Mm -hmm. or whatever there's impact that happens when we come together there's energy things and we don't have to get into all that but um but that that impact of the declarations i believe that the church in this hour we are entering a season um of declarations a season of declaring heaven and and binding what's bound in heaven we is bound on earth and all those things that we're not just focused on doing our daily duty. We're not the religious people or the ecclesia, the called out church of God that is here to execute judgment and the kingdom realm on the earth and to have dominion. And, uh, and that picture, when you, when you describe that to me, that is a, is a picture of what I was feeling in my heart. Yeah. And, and you know, the fact that what we, the, the impact that I saw was really um, everyone's faith, you know, in connection with each other. So it's, you know, faith is a substance. And so looking at the fact that that impact went forward because the, everyone that had come to D.C. were the, the ones who had worked to get there, like actually made an effort, bought the tickets, drove the hours, flew, got the housing, all of that. So... There is something about making an effort and putting forth some type of work uh, to to get there. That uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't there for anything else. I wasn't there to sightsee and to you know yeah it's neat to see the sights, but my goal to be there was to to release my faith for the restoration of our country, and I was not alone in that. And so what I saw was this connection of faith, this convergence of faith. And, and all brought forth by Rabbi Khan and, and his, his pulling everyone together, blowing the trumpet, and everyone's faith is released at once. Now, okay. the, the second thing that, I, uh, that happened is that God actually spoke to my heart uh, in a, right at the end, there was a, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy that was playing at the, the last singer, um, and it was just a, a, it was a soft worship song. It was right before the final prayer and it, everything was done. Like we had, we had made the declarations we had released our faith. We had repented. We had, we had prayed for favor. We, I mean, all of the things that, that we had come to do had been done. And it was during that song and it was literally like someone just pulled a, a wool blanket over my head all the sound of the speakers got muffled. Everything got muffled. It was a, it was a, that was a physical awareness that happened in that I could not uh, hear or engage with everything around me like I had been. It, it, it softened. And he spoke to my heart and he said, I will do it. I will do it because you have asked in my ways. And then he said, be thankful for Rabbi Khan." Because if this had not been done by a Jew, it would not have been done in the right way. And I thought, you know, you can argue with that if you want. You can say, I don't like that if you want. It still doesn't change it. God doesn't care if you don't like it. He still set it up in that way. And 
when uh, my understanding that came from that then was that okay, this is the first time that a national prayer call for revival was led by a Jew, not just a Jew, but a son of Aaron, of the line of Aaron and of uh, the Levite tribe. He is, a, he is a, a rabbi and of the priestly line. And that this call to repentance was done in the, in the right way, that God is a God of order. And we as Americans think, oh, we're just going to pray for revival and, you know, we, we want to see an explosion and, you know, we like blowing things up and, and you know, exciting things like that. And we, we want to do it in our own way. And God says, I have set up the way to do it. Now, the fact that Jesus actually fulfilled the law makes so that we don't actually have to keep everything down to the letter in order to receive the benefits of that. But at the same time, there is a specificity that comes from when, when a Jew is doing the, the, um, the call to repentance and it is on the, the anniversary of the, the Sabbath of the return um, from the prophet Jeremiah. The, the, all of these, these s- symbolic things and very significant things are happening and, and have happened thousands of years ago. Um, I was... I was so overcome and overwhelmed by the ancient nature of what we were doing. This was not just a one-day thing. This was not something that was just happening within a couple hundred years of our country. This is something that is thousands of years old, and we actually got to participate in it. We got to be a part of it, release our faith in it. And through that, because it was done in the proper way, not that God would hold something back from us just because we didn't do it properly. He's already given all of it to us. He's, he's provided all of it to us. But it was because in doing it in his way, we came fully into alignment with his kingdom, which allows all of it to naturally come into fruition. And so his answer of I will do it is, and the fact that we did it in the, in the right way, to me was the most significant thing. I, I, just, I just began to weep because it was not, uh, it was not something that I had solicited and, and asked for, and yet there it was, the answer. And I truly believe that Saturday, September 26th, was the change. That that, that was the catalyst that began the shift that uh, literally brings the renaissance, the, the restoration of our country back, not just in, uh, okay, we look at economy, we look at you know all of the, the indicators of a healthy culture, healthy society. But this was more about uh, bringing back the sobriety of heart, uh, reverence for God and for the kingdom of God and for the word of God, not just uh, what, what people are, you know, would have been fearful of in control of you know, pastors and churches and, and all of that. No, this is a bringing back the heart to God. And so that I, I truly believe that this is the shift that, that uh rolls away the deception that has been in cloaked over this country. Uh, and five years ago, the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, abortion will be fully outlawed in this country. And I began speaking that to people and telling that to people for, for years now. And people, you know, initially uh, would laugh. I mean, during Obama was actually president at the time. And, and uh, you know, people would just say, there, there's no way. It's too far along. You, you can't stop it. It's too, it's too massive. There's too much money. There's too much... And I'm telling you, there will be a time in this country where abortion will be fully outlawed. And so this is the beginning of all of the changes. Abortion is an indicator, again, of the the health of the society. And so when people begin to see life and the value of life for what it really is, not just, you know, how it affects me personally, but what it really is, all of those things begin to change. I think that Whenever we were there, the scripture came to my mind in Joshua 5 where um, they crossed the Jordan into the promised land. They get circumcised. And then it says, in that moment, God removed the reproach of Egypt off of them. And I, I've been pondering that since we got back. What What did that actually mean? But I think that there was this... Even in the wilderness, when all the miracles were happening, they still had the slave mentality. They still had the uh, I'm being controlled mentality. When they got to the promised land, God wanted to remove that reproach. And what I see September 26, 2020, of what happened at the return was 
that God, because of humbleness and because of asking, repenting, and all the different things that happened that day, that God rolled the reproach of Egypt, the reproach of sin off of us Mm -hmm. as a nation. That's really good. And they did not understand what that really meant until they had to go to Jericho and and all the different Mm -hmm. cities um, because God was their provider in the wilderness. Now God was saying, I need you to go do something. And I think that we're in this as a church. We're in this transition. Um, Also in Joshua 5, right after that, uh, Joshua saw a man, it's capital M, he saw a man, it was actually God, and he was holding a sword, and he said, I don't know if you're for me, mm-hmm. or if you're for my enemy, oh, okay, so you can go read that, but um, the interesting thing about that was, was God appeared differently to them after they crossed into the promised land, and expected something different from them than just receiving the miracles, and oh, it's a good time, our shoes don't wear out, and we always have food, and when we cry out, he answers, and all that stuff. Now it's I've rolled the reproach of being a slave off of you. Now you're free in a land that I've given you. Now there's going to be battle, but I've already won the victory. And and then so Joshua says, okay, he lays down, he gives reverence to God. Um, long story on how we know it's God there, but um, the beginning of chapter six, march around the city right? Mm -hmm. God appears with a sword. Now he's saying, march around the city, do it completely different than what I would, what you would think you should do. And I believe that as a church, we're in that season, September 26, 2020, God rolled the reproach off of the country, but there's still battles to be won, but the victory is already there. The victory is ours, but we have to listen every single day to know the strategy of heaven, because it may say, walk around the city. It may say, go in and annihilate all of them, um, whatever that is. And I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying we have to be listening to the commander in chief of our heart, which is God, uh, and understanding what he's calling us to do in this season. Yeah, actually, I, I actually just prepared a message, uh, today, uh, on (laughs) this and it's about, uh, obedience and Mm -hmm. the fact that there's three main things that are key for breakthrough in a person's life or in a country and, you know, but specifically the fact that you have to hear God's voice. If you can't hear his voice, you obviously won't do what he's saying because you can't hear him. Secondly, see God's vision for you and see God's vision for, for our country or for, you know, your sphere of influence. And then third, do what he says. (laughs) And, and, and and really uh, it sounds simplistic sounds, uh, you know, okay, we can do that. Most, uh, most, and I would say it's probably hard to just make this broad brush every problem in our life, but I would say a, a, a huge majority of the problems in our lives come from the fact that we have somewhere along the way just not done what he said. Either we didn't hear him, first of all, or we heard and it wasn't logical, it didn't make sense, and why would I do that, and we didn't do it, and we run into a wall. Because the bottom line is God will never lead you into a wall. And he's good. So if you hear his voice, you see his vision, and you do what he says, I promise you won't hit a wall. And if you roll back in scripture about the promised land, the first time they're there, he said, I'm giving you this land. And Mm -hmm. they said, we heard that, but we don't believe it. So we're going to (laughs) send some spies in there because maybe we'll just believe them. And, uh, and they'll take the heat off of us. And so that's what they did, and they lost a generation. And so I believe that we've done that as a country. Mm-hmm. I believe that we've lost a lot of time because we haven't been obedient to what God has said and taken the victory that we've been given. Um, but now I believe we're in that second phase. We're in the promised land. Now we are at a point where the light that God has put in us is shining further and brighter and stronger than ever before in the church. And we're ready to see an awakening of the general uh, population of the world to his love, not to his church, not to religion, but to the love of the Father. And in a desperate time when it's so dark and fathers are uh, absent and 
um, institutions can't love people, people love people. And so we have to be able to reconcile that with our, uh, with our family, our friends, our coworkers to say, I'm here to display God's love. And in doing so, we'll see transformation, just like you talked about the protesters. We're just going to show you love, and that's what he calls us to do. Yeah, and and uh, the fact that, you know, looking forward, just, just saying, here we are, this is, you know, the 30th of, of September 2020, and, and uh, look ahead. It doesn't necessarily get easier. Like, you know, you, you say, <laughs> oh, this these are the best days these are the best days of our country. Well, they really are the most formative. Now, our founding fathers, they, they uh, were on their knees. Uh, the Second Continental Congress spent hours in prayer every time that they would meet. Uh, Benjamin Franklin made this plea of, of, you know, unless we ask for the, the, the help of divine providence, unless we ask for God's help, we're, we're wasting our time. Uh, all of the, I mean, those men pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. They knew that it required something of them. And we are in a place just like that, where the, the progress from here forward requires us to pledge our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. And by that, it, it, it looks different for every single person because we're, we are in different spheres of influence. But we can look at we can look ahead just in the same in the same way that the founding fathers looked ahead and saw a, a prosperous nation and a, and a nation that becomes a blessing to the world. This country is on the verge of becoming the greatest blessing it has ever been to the world, uh, and it is going to require those of us who are believers, those of us who actually walk in the kingdom of God, to bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth and to establish His kingdom here, which is a kingdom of blessing and favor and 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 goodness and love. And so we carry that in our hearts. And when we encounter a problem, we encounter someone who is frustrated or, or angry or even militant against us, uh, we have to know. We truly have to know the king. We have to know where we stand. And it can't be something that we're sort of, you know, willy-nilly about. We need to be, we need to be strong and true to what the, the king uh, and the kingdom represent. And so when I look ahead, I look forward, I see hope and excitement and, and this, these great days ahead, especially, you know, looking at uh, not knowing where manufacturing is going to be and, and the you know, specifics of the economy. Who knows what's going to happen with, with China, what's going to happen with other countries and relations and all of this stuff. You know what? When we take our place, we can become the manufacturing center of the world. We can become... The, and we already are, the, the energy leader in the world, uh, the specifics of where we are as a country, it's already happening. It's already, it has begun, but it will fall flat and it will fail if, if Christians, if believers do not take their place in civil government, if believers do not take their place in local, uh, you know, school teacher location uh, um, positions um, and positions of influence wherever they are, uh, we should be the business leaders and, and the civic leaders. So those things, I really do believe we are in a place and we are positioned and the, the church is already awake. There, n maybe not everyone, but there are, there are large groups of people who are saying, no more. We're, we're not going to do this again. We've already been, we, we've been to the Jordan. We've been around the wilderness for 40 years and we've lost every, all these lives. We're not going to do it again. And I, I, I mean, I'm one of them. Yep. And you're one yep. of them. And there's a lot of, there's oh, 100,000 people that showed up <laughs> exactly. in, in the, in the nation's exactly. capital to say, no more. We're going to take, and, and we're not going to, we don't need to do it with, with um, you know, a militant approach. We do it by taking over and, and being responsible where responsibility has been lacking. And so the challenge to you today as you're watching, listening to this is go actually engage with the return. You can do it through uh, livefromthereturn.com. You can go there, sign up. You'll get some emails with some information and connection to the app, the AGA app, um, the AGA network app. And, uh, and what I would like to encourage you to do is to go through that recording. What we've described to you is our take of it today. We sort of recapped the return today. Um, and I want you to go and listen. I want you to 
ingest it. I want it to change parts of your life. And then I want you to comment below uh, in any of the chat boxes or comments on Facebook. Uh, give it a give it a an emoji. You know, do whatever. Just engage with what we're talking about so that we can hear what God is speaking to you through this event. And, uh, and the stuff that we've discussed today, we'd love to hear you question that and, and engage with that and send us, send us your comments on all of that. But ultimately, I want to ask you this question today. You today, are you willing to pledge your life, your fortune, and your sacred honor for the kingdom of God to be made manifest upon the earth? That's the challenge of today. Doran, thank you so much for being here. Wingerdministries.org is the website. Go there, follow them, sign up. They got all kinds of cool nifty texting things where they can give you updates and you can give right on the website support. So seed into their field. Thank you for joining us here on this podcast, which is just my heart, is that we are able to recap, to go over and just restructure, talk about, and... uh and sum it up every single time. So thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to another episode of Sum It Up. You can check us out at thesummitdover.com and you can email us at summitup at thesummitdover.org. Wow.